I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rom, today is the last in our series on Lu Xun, and we are looking at a speech by Mao made in October 19th, 1937. Uh, this is in Yan'an when Mao is hiding away in, in the hills uh, north of Xi'an. Both the Japanese are attacking him and, and the uh, KMT based at this point still in Nanjing, I believe, soon to be Chongqing. Uh, and Mao, as a part of his discussion of, of where he sees socialist literature going, has this encomium to Lu Xun. And, Rob, could you just briefly summarize this, this work, which it's a speech that you translated and we're going to put on the podcast webpage. Yeah, I translated it because this is really the party line and party with a capital P, the Chinese Communist Party line on Lu Xun. This is really where you get all of the elements of the modern Lu Xun that you will encounter if you're in the PRC someday and you bring Lu Xun's name up. But it's also one of the reasons why Lu Xun is so poorly received in a lot of literary circles around the globe is because the Lu Xun that we see on display here is very, very different than the one you will have encountered if you've listened to any other part of this series. So I'm going to summarize the speech real quick, and then you and I can kind of dig into it. Mao is faced with a problem, and it's something that a lot of future communist leaders will encounter, is how do you deal with Lu Xun? So Mao points out that, yes, it's true that Lu Xun was never a party member, a party with a capital P again, but, and this is a quote, his thoughts, actions, and written works are all Marxist. He was a Bolshevik from outside the party. So in other words, the guiding thought is that although Lu Xun never joined the party, he was a party member in spirit. And this is crucial because the spiritual aspect runs all through it. Just shortly below that, he talks about Lu Xun being the saint. And this is literally Shengren, like a, almost a supernatural figure. Lu Xun's value to China, writes Mao, as far as I am concerned, is as China's first saint. Confucius was feudalist society, saint in Lu Xun is modern China's saint. It's important whenever you have a saint to explain what their saint-like qualities were. And for Mao, there's three of them. There are three things in proper Lu Xun spirit. So his first saint-like quality was his political foresight, which of course for Mao means he could see ahead and see the value of communism, the value of sweeping aside feudal society, etc., etc. The second great distinguishing feature was his fighting spirit, his refusal to compromise, his refusal to give in to reform elements that were not going to establish China on a good, solid, modern footing. And the third distinguishing point, the third saint-like quality, was his spirit of self-sacrifice, that he was uncompromising. He dedicated himself to his task. He didn't care what people thought about him. Even if they were going to crush him, he was going to keep arguing what he knew to be true. So all of these three things are what made Lu Xun the saint of modern China, and they're what make him a Marxist or a Bolshevik from outside the party. So that's essentially Mao's whole argument. And then what he does with that is he says, and now, and Lucian's example, his resoluteness, his political foresight, is why we have to destroy the Japanese. So much of this this speech is Mao taking the real Lucian and uh, kind of as if he were Plato, turning him in to the Lucian that he wants, right? So Mao is at this time getting a lot of support from the USSR. The USSR is run by Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin's greatest enemy at this time is Trotsky. Mao imagines Lucian to have an anti-Trotsky perspective. Mao takes the real Lucian, which real Lucian was a socialist thinker. You know, he was very much a creature of the left. He is embedded in a lot of leftist thought at the point he died, and Mao imagines him, he reimagines him as a Marxist, he reimagines him as a as a communist. Mao says Lucian was against feudalism, which if you interpret feudalism to mean kind of the backwardsness of traditional Chinese culture, which is what Mao I, I believe means at this point, 
then yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. Lu Xun was highly critical of a lot of elements of traditional Chinese culture, even though he is coming out of the tradition of of this uh, Confucian training. He's also very critical of that of that training, much like James Joyce, who was who was very critical of his his Catholic upbringing. Mao takes this uh, real Lu Xun, who is actually you know, very critical of traditional elements of China, and he reimagines that as a kind of anti-imperialism. Uh, one of real Lu Xun's points is that China has failed because of its its backwards culture. Mao tries to reimagine that as if he is against imperialism, but there was this tension in Lu Xun's time that asked whether China was failing because foreign powers were were coming in or foreign powers were coming in because China was failing. And I think Lu Xun would have definitely been uh, supported the latter statement much more. I mean, he wasn't a friend of, of foreign imperialist in China, but, but he was definitely focused on the problems of traditional Chinese culture. Mao reimagines that to be anti-imperialist and to be a uh, Japan-facing attack. Well, what's especially important about this and I think I would almost argue that he's not presenting Lu Xun as the ideal Marxist so much as the saint of Marxism or even the saint of modern China. I think that Sheng Ren is incredibly important because saints aren't allowed to be conflicted, complicated, tortured, dark. I mean, they can't be. Why would you have a conflicted, complicated saint? They have to work miracles. They have to be... Role models, right? You can't have a role model who's also an incredibly dark individual. And the reason that's fascinating is because so much of what I see misinterpreted, what seems to me at least to be misinterpreted in Lu Xun, comes from this this need to see him as the revolutionary, the fighter, the martyr, right? That there's nothing, he's not allowed to have flaws. And, and what I find interesting in this speech is Mao hi- highlights quite a few things that were true of Lu Xun, but within Lu Xun's own writings, the opposite are frequently also true. So each of those saint-like qualities, for example, has elements in, in Lu Xun's works that are the opposite of that. So, you know, we can start with this first saint-like quality being his political foresight. If you take the Lu Xun of the early days the very early days before 1911 as someone who's looking at modern China and talking about, for example, how important individuality is and refusing to simply agree with the traditional culture, you can see a lot of foresight there. But when we get to something like the introduction to Nahan, most of that is a reflection on how he never really seemed to know what the future was going to be, which is why his friend has to effectively talk him out of early retirement to get going again. This is not the this is not the the Lu Xun who sees deeply into the future and knows where he's going. His his second saint like quality, according to Mao, is his fighting spirit. Now, as as we've said, this is both true and untrue. It is true in the sense that a lot of his best writing does manifest a refusal to accept that the reality around him is is a given. That this is the only thing that you can possibly have. On the other hand. You also have the illusion of Wild Grass, who is distinctly resigned, who seems to have just surrendered the his, his life and the world around him to, to chaos, effectively. And then you have his third saint-like quality, which is his self-sacrifice. Now again, both true and untrue, right? Because even in his own works, you have, you know, the... We just, I don't know when this is going to air in terms of the series, but we just did an interview with Alec Ash about the story, A Minor Incident. And the narrator of that story is about the most selfish individual you could possibly hope to find. The thing that I find most interesting about this speech is how different this Lucian is from the real Lucian. So the real Lucian is is a humanist. He He's very uh, much involved with his his art you know at at one point he was thinking of just essentially retiring and becoming a kind of an antiquarian right uh you right. know just just studying these old texts the lucian in this speech is a bloodthirsty uh warrior i'm just going to read a passage he that is lucian did not shirk from using his pen like the cutting edge of a knife against all that he hated 
he was often the one standing in the breach of the ba- of a battlefield, stubbornly holding out, calling for the advance. This is this is warrior Lucian. This is this is Mao's image of Lucian that he's trying to construct for folks who are in battle, in a real battle, as as he's speaking. You know, these people, the people who are hearing him, are, are some of them are going to die fighting, and and so he's making Lucian into this saintly. Figure, but it's a, a violent saint, right, Rob? Yeah, I mean, it's awfully hard. It's awfully hard to inspire people with wild grass. No one's going to wave that as they charge into the breach, right? Um, <laughs> well, and it it, it does, does give you an indication too of how something like Diary of a Madman could be read the way it often is in the PRC, which is a relatively straightforward attack on Confucianism. Now, if Lu Xun is really as as you've just read the man who wields his pen like a knife and stands in the vanguard, etc. There's only one way to read Diary of a Madman, and that is as a protest against traditional culture. And that's t- that's how I was told to read it when I when I first read the story. That's what it meant. And that's why I, when I started my graduate career, didn't really care that much for Lu Xun, is because he's he is pictured in today's PRC still, I think, as the man wielding the pen as if it were a knife, grabbing, you know, climbing up the battle works and and ready to go out and and kill some 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 enemies of China. But as as we kind of wrap this series up, I hope we've presented a more nuanced vision of Lucian. You know, that Lucian, to be fair to Mao, Lucian was very much grounded in this leftist social critique of Chinese thought. He was a leftist, and and we respect that. Um, We're not saying Mao is wrong about that because he's not. But we hope we've shown how complicated Lucian is and how flat the modern PRC version of Lucian is. Lucian is not a warrior. He is someone who is uh, a thinker. He had ideals, definitely, but he was also so complicated. And Diary of a Madman, Aq, uh, when we did that interview with Alec Ash, uh, we were struggling with where is the narrator positioned in terms of Lu Xun. It's this very modernist work that Lu Xun is able to paint in a in a way that that is kind of Proustian. And I would throw in there. The corrective is actually not very complicated. And, you know, at one point in the series, I remember thinking, in our current geopolitical climate, I think both U.S. and Chinese readers would benefit from reading more of Lu Xun. And the reason for that is because Lu Xun did, like like Mao said, criticize a lot of capitalist modernity. I realize it's a loaded term. I'm just sort of drawing off of the the tradition here. The big difference is that he did not set himself on the other side of that. He put himself into the problem as well. He's in his stories criticizing his own background, right? He's, He's not saying, I'm over here, modernity and all capitalism, all that is over there. In that story, A Minor Incident, he writes in the first person a narrator who's a rich jerk. He's got his classical and modern references all mixed up. We never know 100% where he stands because that's then it has to be on purpose. By the time he hit his main career in 1916, he'd already lived quite a life and had seen it's not as simple as the problem is over there and I am over here. I am also a part of the problem. And, and Rob... Your statement was so ambiguous. I just want to point out when you were saying he, it at times sounded like you were talking about Lucian, the writer, and at times you were talking about the the narrator of that story, a minor incident. Hmm. But the mere fact that you're doing that shows, and this is something we struggled with in our uh, interview with with Alec. It, it shows how difficult it is to disentangle Lucian, the writer, from the narrator in that story, and. The sort of standard PRC interpretation is is this is Lucian coming to the realization that he was a bad guy for for looking down on the poor. But there's so much that's such a flat interpretation of that story. This vision of Lucian that Mao presents is really the beginning of that flattening out of Lucian. It's it's the first step. Um, and today, you know, 
the the flat version of Lu Xun is is the one that most people encounter. You know, we're we're kind of relying some on the Julia Lovell translation, and at the end of that translation is uh, an afterword by Li Yun, uh, a Chinese American writer, and it's it's incredible because in the afterwards of that translation, she essentially says. I don't like Lucian. <laughs> you know, this is a this is an afterword that's supposed to promote Lovell's translation, and and Lee goes, mm, I don't like him. <laughs> and as I was reading Li Yun's uh, short essay, I realized that she doesn't like him. I think because she she doesn't like flat Lucian, and she's never really encountered. I don't think the the complicated Lucian that is the modernist thinker, the modernist writer. She's only, Li has only encountered Lu Xun in classrooms in the PRC. Uh, and, and it's interesting to see that tension between full-bodied Lu Xun and flat Lu Xun. Full-bodied Lu Xun being, since we're wrapping this up and wrapping the series up, a writer who had many, many different hats. He stood in many places, had many perspectives, in one story, he will present what appears to be a critique of classical culture, but then give you a very sympathetic drawing of one of the characters who's supposed to be the classical joke, right? Like something like Kong Yiji, which we talked about with, with Brian Van Norden, Professor Brian Van Norden. The, the central character being a washed up Confucian scholar, and yet he's presented with still this almost pitying, sympathetic eye, so we're not allowed to hate him. You can't hate him. So... It's never as simple as identifying this and this and this problem. Lucian mixes them all up and jumbles them all together. He jumbles his narrators. He jumbles his perspectives. And that's ultimately why he's so important to read. Because any given political problem you can think of, if it's presented in Lucian, it's going to be so mixed up, you're not going to be exactly sure where you land, which is, of course, the correct way to to deal with a lot of these struggles is that's intentional on Lu Xun's part. You're not supposed to know where to land. Absolutely. If you can't question yourself in the middle of things like this, you're not understanding them correctly. And that's the problem with Mao's Lu Xun as presented in the speech is that it's very clear where Mao thinks Lu Xun would land, but I never really no, and that's not the Lucian that I read in his stories. You have to ignore no. large parts of, of Lucian's work to come to that. And I, I think that's the thing I struggle with, with Mao's representation of Lucian in the speech and in general, the interpretation of Lucian throughout the PRC. Agreed. 100% agreed. And I hope if you, dear listener, have listened to all of this series, you will by now appreciate some of the tension here in the presentation of a absolutely magnificent writer. And hopefully you will understand why he's worth reading. Just a simple, just a simple statement. I mean, you could make a lot of grander points, but simply put, why read Lu Xun? Well, if you've listened to part of the series, you should be able to answer that question because there's so much going on that you just don't want to miss it. I think that's a great final thought for this series, Rob. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.